Oh, a comedian okay. I had on my radio show told me what every joke must have, and it, it permanently stayed with me, and he was right. Surprise and a victim. Hmm. Hmm. Analyze any joke you know, and you will find that that is the case. Hmm. Even if the victim is yourself, doesn't matter. Hmm. That's the best kind of joke. Uh, the best, the yes. best kind yes. of joke. The English are particularly good at that. Is that self denigrating You bet, mm -hmm. you bet. And that's is that true? Not at all, not at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are not meant to just celebrate the, 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 the terror that is, like you were saying about the, we're not meant to just celebrate the terror that is brought upon the Egyptians either. Because it's the end of anti-creation. It's got to be comprehensive, it's got to be total. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That'll be my new gesture, everybody will know what I mean. <laughs> I've always thought about the, the Jewish emphasis on education is like it's the one thing you can take with you as you're driven from place to place. And a violin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, and a book. Right, or a scroll. Right, right. And By there's the a way, lot of, you, your comment reminded me you'll, you'll enjoy this. So this is not meant as a joke, by the way, but it is, a, it is funny nevertheless. The rabbis ask, so what has God been doing since creation? It's a very fair question. And their answer is bringing couples together which shows you how hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> and when the stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. That's his symbol of assimilation. assimilation eh? And he shall be as one that is born in the land. Hmm. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Yeah, so that's the marker of belonging, and, and that's why that's yeah, so important. Yeah, it actually also happens to be an external skin which is removed, mm -hmm. like a garment of skin which is removed. Right, well, and it's also something that allows the phallus, the fellow-centric fellas to shine forth in some real sense. Yeah. Well, it, well, and you got you got to put blood in the deal. Like it's not an easy point the game, answer, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was trying to avoid that, Pajero, <laughs> but I'm glad you got. That's good. That's good. Well yeah. done. That's tefillin in Jewish history. That's the the boxes that you see on religious Jews when they pray. The black box at the forehead and the black box on the arm. They each contain uh, a portion of the Torah on parchment in those boxes. There are two examples of this. This is called tefillin. In English, it's phylacteries. I never met any human who knew what phylacteries was who didn't know what tefillin was. So it's a, a useless translation. <laughs> but that's what it is. It's those I boxes. See. So this is another injunction straps. to remember. That's to right. remember the of spirit of that which took you mm -hmm. out. You know? Well, I guess, I guess Jews aren't quite prepared yet, maybe over the course of generations, to say God took the Jews out of, out of Hitler's Europe. It's hard to say, given the staggering number who were murdered. Right. Well, I think it's a mistake not to. It's also a mistake not to remember the horror, because you also want to appreciate the depths of the tyranny. Right. And then, if something How could, if something could overcome could even that, what must it be? I, I, I like. I think we should remember both. You, you, you've affected this Jew. Uh, it's a very powerful point. Well, you know, I start, spent a lot of time studying the Holocaust, and what I learned from it wasn't the misery. Mm -hmm. Although I learned that. Mm -hmm. It was that something overcame the misery. And what was it that overcame the misery? Well, that's what we're all trying to figure out, Dennis. Really. I mean, really. That's what we're all trying to figure out. Well, the whole injunction was, remember, so it doesn't happen again. Okay, remember what? Remember the misery? Or remember remember the spirit of Solzhenitsyn? Or do you remember the spirit of Viktor Frankl, right? Do you... Is it, it what is what is what we're remembering that which enabled us to overcome the tyranny and the malevolence? It's got to be that because we can't just remember the well, terror. It was Allied tanks that overcame the tyranny. Yeah, well, that's also something, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's yeah. why I'm a, I'm a tank fan. Right, <laughs> right, right. I have a, a thought about what you just said about what's different. And so, what's interesting for me is what this is. A, so, first of all, it's very it's very humbling for me to be here because. The level yes, it should be. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's partly why you were invited. That's right. Just for the humbling, man. It's true. It's true, though. Well, science is actually the process, not the consequence, in some real sense, right? And you sound like a science denier. <laughs> well, certainly. Well, one of the things you learned, Thomas Kuhn pointed this humbler. out too, is that right, because when 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 a novelist, Greg can speak on this more, but when a novelist represents the world you're going to base it to some degree on your experience because you have nothing else to talk about otherwise, but then you incorporate all sorts of other things into the story that make it, in some sense, more than what 
It's two ways of looking at it. It's more than what merely happened. But there's another way of looking at it, whereas it's, it's a truer and more universal account of what actually happened. It's right. also the most inane, like, chiron that comes up at the beginning of a movie where they say, based on real events. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. As opposed to what? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. what's yeah. another option? Super, this super, is super. Yeah. Like, That's where great. <laughs> there's a story, a story about, about John Lewis, then it might be apocryphal and it might be misquoting it, which, which let me just undermine the story a hundred ways. But I believe that this is right, that when he was on the bridge in Edmund Pettus, part of what their training was for nonviolence was to envision the cops beating them as boys, as sons. And that was what held them in restraint. And that's what tacks to a more, to a transcendental value that can be transformational. So I say, I offer that to Dennis Prager, angel of vengeance over here. <laughs> <laughs> but Dennis, you, you're good. bringing in. By these. the way, I just want to say on behalf of the Israelites, who I, I share the Torah's view of generally, 40 years of manna, is is a challenge. I just I, I, I think we have to be honest here in a, in assessing forty years of the greatest pizza possible. So the rabbis, the rabbis actually, you'll love this. The rabbis, they they knew they, these were not dummies. These rabbis, they they knew forty years of something is 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 is, is a problem. So they developed the belief, and it's traditional uh, belief. It's not Torah based, but it's traditional that the manna tasted any way in which you wanted it to taste. And I remember hearing this in third grade and thinking, wow, <laughs> pastrami on rye any time I want it? And then I envied the Hebrews in the desert. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very Jewish story. I would like, I'd like well, to point that out. Right wait, to the pastrami why is it a Jew? on rye. Oh, yeah, the pastrami God. on rye is Jewish. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 if you want to imagine BLT as a non-Jew, you are totally... <laughs> Here's the other, okay, with I the picked other the part. Pastrami on yeah, the I other part that's totally Jewish is that literally you have like food from the heavens and and you go immediately to the overwrite cantaloupe complaint with it. It's like <laughs> it's it's literally food that has descended yeah, from right, the heavens. Right, and right, you're like, that's for five years. Yes, right. that's right. Exactly. I, 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 that's why it's a perfectly apt story. Like, can we get pretzel bread? <laughs> like, no, no, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I'm here as a man who's learned to do what Jordan Peterson tells him to do. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh. <laughs> so what have you been up to, Moses? Yes. It's like, well, you know, there was a plague, a sequence <laughs> of plagues, and there's a des this whole Red Sea thing. <laughs> How about you, Jethro? Yeah. <laughs> How's every little thing? <laughs> Part of the genius of the Emperor Augustus when he get gets power after the end of the Civil War in 31, BC is that he presents himself as living a very kind of monastic life. He lives in a little hut on the top of the, the Palatine Hill, and and he's saying he launches like a big back to basics campaign, uh, stress on the family, simplicity. He renounces all his titles. That's right, renounces all his titles as he's acquiring more and more power and founding one of the greatest sort of imperial well, dynasties that, the world's ever known. It's funny. Uh, and now I'm, now I'm going to make the point I debated whether to make because I don't like to differ with. Plato, who am I? <laughs> but I, if the only thing I knew about a person was that he was an ascetic, I would not vote for him. <laughs> so so right. don't you, I mean, when you're starting with young people, don't you start with something that's obvious, obvious to them that it's true, mm -hmm. and then work from there? So like, there's a lot of things we know. We know that we're more capable, better than dogs. Right, although some dogs are better than some people. And, <laughs> and we know that, right? And so what's higher about us? And then imagine that perfected. I think that's C.S. Lewis's argument for God that he makes over and over, and it's also all over Thomas Aquinas. And that, that means that there seems to be an order of the beings, and it seems to go up. And Otherwise, then, yeah, what would we strive that, towards? I told you, that's what I, that's what I, that's my strategy, exactly. Yeah. Well, they don't even, 
accept any longer. Uh, it is quite popular on the left that we're not superior to animals. Yeah, it's because they're. Deep but it, but the they thing don't is, that. Dennis, nobody is really they don't, they don't stop oh, striving. I, I think they do. The, yeah. the, the well, anti-humanist yeah. element of 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 the uh, climate change movement, mm. and I don't deny climate change, just for the record. But the the hysteria leading to the belief that human beings are a blight on nature, animals are not, yeah. is very deep at this time. You know, the movie, The Matrix, that's a, you guys watch movies, that's a uh, turning point when Agent Smith is interrogating, uh, what, Morpheus under torture, and he moves the sweat off his forehead and tastes it and smells it. You're a virus. I figured out what right. the human beings are. They're cancer right. on the right. on the right. earth, right. Right. right? And that's oh, you see the same thing in the Marvel series where the the, the, the there's a Thanos, yeah, who's Thanatos fundamentally. Yeah. Thanos, he wipes out half of everything for the good of being. Also, yes, this uh, is a very on the deep great problem. issues of our time. Uh, I uh, I am certain that not it's not a matter of faith. I am logically, rationally certain that in, in America at least, and probably in the West generally, as a generalization with acknowledged exceptions, religious people are far more rational than the radically secular. And as one of the reasons, by the way, that I have come to believe in God is because I realize that my love of reason, why well, I call my commentary or the rational Bible, is because I use reason. My love of reason is dependent upon there being a God. Mm -hmm. Well, the, Jung, one of the yeah. things that really struck me about Jung, and it was a surprise to me when I encountered it, was his insistence in some sense that Catholicism, he just used that as an example, he said, that's as sane as people get. Everything other than that is way worse. And so, despite its peculiarities and eccentricities and medieval madness well, Voltaire, and all of that. the great atheist said, I'm an atheist. But frankly, I hope my wife, my butler, my driver, and everyone I work with believes in God. <laughs> yeah, very funny, very funny. I think it was a Chesterton who said that the definition of the madman is not the person who's lost his reason, but who's lost everything except his reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did Chesterton say anything stupid? <laughs> no. In every, private, maybe. Every time, yeah. what? Just as a joke. In private, maybe. Oh, in private, that's fine, though. That can, I mean, he got yeah, it out yeah, in yeah, private. <laughs> Chester, I mean, apropos of this, it's attributed to Chesterton. I couldn't verify that he said it, but why not? Uh, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Yes, yes. yes it's yes, been yes, very yes. hard to actually locate that question. I know, that's why I said But yes. he ought to have said it. That's yeah. right. No, if it was anybody did, yeah. what he said. it was him. And right. a lot of what he does say could be distilled into that. Correct. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, well, That's the thing is, is... Winston Churchill quotes, too. Yeah, right. It's the same thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yogi Berra, too. <laughs> you can't move forward into the unknown without faith. You can't organize a community without faith. You can't organize yourself without faith. And so, if you have no faith, you're disorganized. And so, if you do organize yourself, then you have faith in something. And if it's not God, then you have to ask, okay, then, no. what is it? Right. What is it? And that's the blindness of the atheist. It's like, they well, say now so, your God's So their implicit. answer is science. Yeah. That's what they yeah, answer. Well, As if science tells me not to murder yeah. or not to steal something else. Or, or, or to love my neighbor. What, what, are, what are they talking about when they say science? How could that, what, what is the moral will of science? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Science is necessarily subordinate to the ethic of inquiry. Exactly. Yeah, I think I mentioned in the seminar already one of Jung's dictum, which I just love. It was so enlightening to me. He said, the purpose of religious practice is to stop people from having religious experiences. <laughs> so it's a container, right, to stop that. Mediate oh, is a better word. Mediate. It is. It is. It's a, it was a joke. I mean, yeah, he didn't make yeah. jokes that often, that but that was one, and it's a good joke. It's like, <laughs> and, and no wonder. It's like, you want to have a religious experience, do you? Really? You really want that? Is Jordan like, trying to convert the rest of you to Jung? <laughs> <laughs> Only implicitly. <laughs> he he hid the fact that he was a Christian. You said poor old Moses. So thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's.
free yourself. There was a chair in my house. I wonder if any of you had this, and I, I don't think it even exists today. There was a chair in my house was known as dad's chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The kids didn't sit in it. That mm -hmm. is a perfect manifestation of honoring, and your point is critical, uh, I, I, that mm -hmm. you, you're, mm -hmm. we're not commanded to love our parents. Mm -hmm. People need to understand. Mm -hmm. We have to love our neighbor, we have to love uh, a God, we have to love the stranger, but we don't have to love our parents. And there is no other thing that we are demanded that we honor other than God. Mm -hmm. That is how critical the parental role is. Do you think that the fact that we've lost Mr. and Mrs. is a reflection of that dishonor? It's all the egalitarian thing. Parents and children, when, before my, my, my father died at the age of 96, I had him on my radio show every birthday. It was a big hit with my, with my listeners. He was a character, my father. <laughs> And, and I bet he, he, was. he would. He, I'm sorry. <laughs> I bet he was. Oh yes, yes. It goes down. It's genetic. I have to admit. So, so, so my, I, I, it, it was like clockwork. I'd go. So, Dad, and it really interested me. He grew up. He was born in 1918. Hmm. This is a long time ago. And and even then, and uh, I would say, so, Dad, what is the biggest difference between uh, America when you grow up and America today? And I, I wouldn't ask every year, so he wouldn't necessarily remember what he had said. But every time I asked it, he had the same exact answer. And that was, the kids rule the house. We have a dad's chair in my house, except half the time the dogs are in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's allowed. That's I'm, I may mention last because time. Because the Ten Commandments were not given to the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> a terrible story of Salvador Dali, who had a terrible relationship with his father. And one day he had a huge row, stormed out of the house, went back home and masturbated and put his semen in an envelope, put on the back of the envelope, paid in full, hmm. and gave it to his dad, hmm. Hmm. as if yeah. that was it. Well, Whereas you think, we owe, we owe our parents life, we owe them identity, and we owe them the very first beginnings in the formation values and all sorts of things. So back to Stephen's well, this, humility, well, this, 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 we owe so much to them. Are any Christians at this table feel you are bound, you're bound, so this is not a challenge. This is, I, I, I am in, I'm in love with America's Christians, uh, uh, to be perfectly uh, uh, open about you. it. <laughs> <laughs> not all, but, uh, but more, at least I'm those very around touched. This table. It is mutual, <laughs> thank you. It, it is a very beautiful thing in my life. Just to really make the, break this and to confess amongst my brothers here, I really struggle with this personally, the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, struggle personally to take a Sabbath. Oh, right. mm -hmm. um, and I, maybe I'm not the only one with iPhones and constant distractions and mm -hmm. I have a busy job. And it's important. I think the work I'm doing is important. As if you're lucky to have work that you cherish, it's good to do that work and... There's always a reason to keep working on Sunday. It is, if you don't do that, then you think that. So what, what I want to ask humbly of all of you, what doesn't, does it, what are your own practices? What makes, That's what I asked. What makes I, a I'm good glad Sabbath? you're asking and, and God bless you for struggling. I'm very bad at it too. You yeah. know, and I, I know this is wrong. When, when, one of the things I did as a clinical psychologist is I had all these high-end lawyers in my practice and they were usually senior partners of large law firms. And the deal was that we made with the firms was you send us your best people and we will make them more productive. Um, they'll, they'll have more billable hours, but we work for them. We're not working for you. And so I, I faced this conundrum with my clients because these were people who were worth a lot of money per hour. And they, they were making 750 to $2,000 an hour. And, and they were working 16 hour days. I mean, I had a woman, one of my clients, she bought a new microwave because it, she could microwave her coffee in 10 seconds instead of 20 seconds in the morning. Like, I mean, her life was scheduled. She was hyper productive. And, uh, and a lot of these people struggled, as you might expect, with work life balance, that cliche. And one of the things I learned quite rapidly was that I could get these people to schedule out vacations two or three months in advance because they couldn't work fewer hours a day. The competition was just too intense. And it wasn't even easy for them to work fewer hours a, month, a, a week. But if they scheduled three months ahead, they could take three or four days. 
and then they could do that. And what we invariably found was, and this is something to think about when you're being driven by that demon of work, is they became more productive. So they got a rest and their billable hours went up because the gain they obtained in efficiency more than, well, and right, it's not surprising in some sense, right? But it was interesting to see that so starkly indicated even to these people. And so you might ask yourself, is like, well, you have all these wonderful opportunities and you want to have your nose to the grindstone and make sacrifices to the proper gods, but it could be that if you took a day off a week, which I don't do, by the way, you would be, you'd be much better at that. Also, because you'd have the opportunity now and then to stop focusing so intensely on the task at hand and to allow yourself to emerge into a state of contemplative reverie, which is indistinguishable from the freedom you need to be creative. But no argument, every argument you made is impeccable and it, none will change well, his behavior. That, you know? That's well, <laughs> for good reason, but this is critical. The only reason I don't work seven days a week is because I think God commanded me. Mm -hmm. The only reason that we have the meals with our kids as intently as we did, and they're, every Jewish family is the same that has this, they're at least three hours. You just sit and talk from everything from is there an afterlife to how the, the, the local baseball team did. Everything is talked that I learned how to think at the Shabbat table, mm -hmm. not at school. Mm -hmm. Because my father and yeah, my brother yeah, would yeah. talk, my brother's six years older than me, went to Columbia, then Harvard, big intellectual. They would have these discussions. Finally, in middle teenage, I started to pipe up and my father would look at me and go, that's nonsense. And yeah. I learned to say to myself, that's nonsense at the Shabbat table, not at school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only because See, God says, keep it. Do we keep it? Mm -hmm. Do so, I keep it? Mm -hmm.